My name is Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. This is a point in the service where we look at God's Word and we, we try to share what He is talking about and that we are currently in Luke's Gospel. Earlier in the service, we had the get to know you question and get to know your neighbor question. And it was asked, like, was there anything that, that you went to recently that you had low expectations, actually exceeded your expectations? And we kind of shared a little bit. And, and I, I, it wasn't recent history. It was quite, quite a long time ago. But I, I said, hope. Uh, is, that, is that bad? Is that wrong? I just, ba- back then... <laughs> It was 90, 1997, and, and Hope was a young church, a church plant, just getting started. And I just heard about it on a whim. It was just across the street from my, my dorm at the U, and I thought like, oh, I, I heard about this church, and some of my friends had kind of come and gone. And I had tried other churches in the area, and so I came into Hope with really low expectations that anything beneficial would come out of it. And then later I would join staff, and now I've been here uh, as a pastor for 11 years, so I, I, I think it's okay. I think it's, it's good. Um, try not to suck. That's kind of really our, our, one of our goals. And so if you, come in, if you come in with higher expectations than that, we, we might not meet them, but if you come in with low expectations, you're telling me there's a chance. Uh, we, we got a chance. Um, any of you like history? Any, any history buffs out there? Okay, does that number decrease significantly if I say political history? Okay, uh, U.S. presidents for a thousand? Uh, okay, for the three of you that are interested, I, a, sh- a short history lesson this morning. Anybody know who this guy is? Anybody recognize that guy? Calvin Coolidge! <laughs> Boom! Actually, they actually shouted at Hope West before you, uh, so they get the points this morning. No, that's that's Calvin Coolidge. I came across him this week in in my study because of one of his quotes. I will get to that quote, but I didn't know anything about Calvin Coolidge. I don't know much about presidential history, and so I was just interested. Like, who is this guy? What did, he, what did he do for the United States of America? Who, who was he? And um, I, I don't know anyone that, like, Coolidge is my guy. Like, maybe some of you, like, have a favorite president. Like, Reagan's your guy, you know. Uh, Kennedy was your guy. Bush, do we have any? Bush was your guy. Uh, depends maybe which one. Anybody a Biden guy uh, coming? No? Uh, I, I had a hand jerk out there. Uh, no? Uh, Coolidge is maybe a little bit more of an obscure reference, so I just want to do a, a short history. Now, it has something to do with the quote later on, but just, it's kind of fun. A little, little lesson here. Going to class this morning. Full name, John Calvin Coolidge Jr. Didn't know that. He's always been Calvin Coolidge to me. I didn't even know he was John Calvin Coolidge. Interesting tidbit, he's the only president born on a certain day of the year. Anyone know which day of the year? Who said it? Fourth of July. (laughs) Wouldn't it be funny if I chose like some nondescript date like uh, May, May 23rd? No other U.S. president was born on May 20th, only Coolidge. No, it was, it was actually the 4th of July. He was born on the 4th of July of 1872. He had, unfortunately, a tremendous amount of tragedy and loss of life. His mom passed away when he was 12, uh, his sister when he was 18, and then he lost his own son when his son was 16 years of age. That last nugget there, his son passing away when he was 16, many thought out of his nickname uh, came that because of of just kind of his experience of losing his son and him turning inward, he got a nickname. Anybody know? Yeah. Nickname, Silent Cal. I mean, Hope West is getting all the answers. I'm pointing to people at East, but Hope West is getting all the answers this morning. Uh, Silent Cal. And a lot of just kind of growing withdrawn and within, 
even as a political leader, even as somebody who had to speak in front of public gatherings, he was known as Silent Cal. There's actually a story that was shared that I found fairly comical. This was well known, that he just, he just doesn't talk. And so a server at one of the kind of parties of D.C., those political gatherings, one of the servers made a bet with another guy. He says, I'll, I'll get him to talk. I bet you before night's end, I can get him to say more than two words tonight. And the other server says, it's on. So then the guy who makes the bet goes over, finds Coolidge, and says, hey, I bet that guy I'm gonna get, that I can get you to say more than two words tonight. And Coolidge responded, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't going to talk. <laughs> Another um, person after his death was told, like, he, you know, President Coolidge, former President Coolidge, he, he passed away. And, and she replied, how, how can anyone tell? Like, he just didn't talk. He was silent <laughs> Cal. He didn't talk. Interesting story about how he met his wife. He met his wife, Grace, at a church gathering. Church gathering, hanging out with the church. You know, think of post-service connection time. <laughs> Coolidge was a church guy looking to get a bagel and a missus. <laughs> worked, out, worked out all right. So when you guys are down there refilling your coffee, just say, I, I heard about this president, and you can just kind of launch into this story and see, see where it goes. No, 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 there's enough pressure on some of you guys. You already feel enough pressure. Don't worry about that. How he assumed the presidency is a fascinating story. Some of you are like so checked out. You're like, he's still going with Coolidge Facts. <laughs> I thought there'd be like two, and then he'd move on to Luke's gospel. How he assumed the presidency he was vice president to Harding, and Harding passed away while president. He was on the West Coast and had a, a massive brain bleed. He passes away. Coolidge was on the East Coast on a vacation, and he is awoken, middle of the night, and this is communicated to him that President Harding's passed away, and, and he will now be sworn in as president. So he gets dressed, he comes downstairs, he greets reporters, his dad, who's a notary public, swears him in as president at 2.47 a.m. Middle of the night, he gets sworn in to be president, kind of around this kerosene lamp. And then it says, he went back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> My first act as commander-in-chief, I will sleep. Uh, isn't that crazy? And how likely... That next morning, did he wake up and go, was that, was that just a dream? Did I just, did I just dream that I became president? He would run on his own platform at the next uh, opportunity, and he would go on and be president for another, another four years. But this guy is actually my wife's favorite president, and she's just finding this out live right now. But listen to this quote about Christmas. Christmas is not a time, nor a season, but a state of mind. To cherish peace and goodwill, to be plenteous in mercy, is to have the real spirit of Christmas. My wife loves Christmas. She now loves uh, President Coolidge. He's, he's her favorite president. But here's ultimately why I grabbed onto some of these facts, is I came across this quote of Coolidge, and I want to I talk about it, and I want to utilize it for today's message, specifically two words. The two words are press on. This is from Coolidge. He says this, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problem of the human race. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Fill that out a little bit more, given the time period that it was happening in, okay? 
So he was president in the 1920s. So what had preceded that was World War I. What would follow him is the Great Depression, and he was kind of tucked in the middle there, though much of his political office happened during World War I. Notably, he stood up for the rights of those who were um, left to the fringes of society at that time. Okay, let me give you three groups that he was noted for trying to help and trying to prosper and lift up. One was Native Americans. He worked for preserving and protecting and securing land rights for Native Americans. Another one, African Americans. He stood up and championed African Americans in the wake of World War I. He spoke of a half a million African Americans that went to World War I willingly and talked about their stellar performance within their uh, respective duties. Alongside that, locally, he fought to remove every single Ku Klux member that was a part of our government. At that time, there were people in the Klan, also in political office, worked to remove them from government. And the last one is he was uh, one of, obviously not the only, but one of um, the political leaders that uh, came alongside in the fight for women's suffrage, that they might receive opportunities to vote. And I'm not trying to make Coolidge out a hero. I'm just trying to give up some of the background in which some of these words could be spoken of, not just to the American people, but to specific groups of people telling them, press on. Press on. It's those same groups of people that maybe potentially were told, you don't have enough talent. You don't have enough genius. You don't have enough education. You don't have enough charisma to lead, to influence, to make a difference. To which he would reply, press on. Press on. What will make something change? What will leave an impact in our world? Press on. Endure. Persist. Keep going. I want to pick up that same message in our account today from Luke's Gospel. If you're new with us, just checking out. We are in one of the accounts of Jesus' life. We are about halfway through that. Jesus has left the northern territory of Israel, okay, where he grew up, where his earliest ministry took place, up in northern parts of Galilee, and he's making his way southward okay, through that nation, and eventually he will get to Jerusalem. He's not there yet. He will get there. But right now, he's kind of traveling through this area, which was known as Samaria. And he is, in one element, kind of meandering, taking his time, getting to Jerusalem. And yet, the phrase that we grabbed onto into chapter 9 is that he has set his face to Jerusalem. And that idea, this idea of enduring, persevering, pressing on, is, is consistent with, it's parallel with this idea of he set his face to Jerusalem. He knows what he has to do. He knows what the Father has called him to, and so he has set his face to Jerusalem. In the meantime, we're picking up stories as we go along. Last week, uh, Trike talked about the narrow door, right? There's the wide door and the narrow door. We must, we must choose. We get the chance to choose this narrow door, which is symbolic of Jesus, walking through that. Wide is the path to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few find it. We must choose Christ. Before that, we talked about um, the, the religious leader that was indignant. Why? Because Jesus chose to heal on the Sabbath. Okay? So we've been walking through, as he goes to Samaria, he's continuing to teach, he's continuing to be about his ministry. And so today that brings us to Luke chapter 13. Just five verses today, not, not a tremendous amount of text. Okay? Very easy for us to make it through here. And ultimately, what I want you to be considering it, Okay? In what areas of your life? And for each person, it's different. And it's different, even if I had delivered this message a, a month ago or a month in the future, your response might be different then. That's why God's word is living and active. It's able right now to meet you where you're at. Now, I want to have that kind of running through your mind, this idea of pressing on. Is there an area of your life that God is calling you to press on, press forward? It's definitely a theme we're going to see throughout today's passage. Let's, let's read through the passage and then I'll take, I'll, I'll, we'll make some notes on it. 
But ultimately asking that question, God, are you calling me to press on? If so, where? What areas of my life? What do you have for me? Let's read. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Look, your house is left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's it. Those are our verses for today. Now, even with a short number of verses, five verses, there's quite a lot going on, a lot of language, and I want to take time to walk through it to explain some of the references that Jesus is making. So let's jump back to the beginning here, okay? Back to verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place. Go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. That is a legitimate threat. How do we know that that's a legitimate threat, that Herod can, he has the ability, the authority to kill people? Already happened, right? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, was killed. By whom? Herod. So this is a legitimate threat, okay? Now, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, hey, warning, warning, look out, Herod wants to kill you. We have to pause there and kind of wrestle through this a little bit. Because many of the religious leaders in Luke's gospel and other gospels are painted very negatively antagonistic toward Christ, antagonistic toward his gospel, to his ministry. They don't believe in him. They don't follow him. If they find themselves around him, they're coming against him. And so are we to understand it that way? Are we to understand this passage that the Pharisees are against him? Are the Pharisees for him? It, it sounds like positive words, right? They're like, hey, just, just a heads up. Someone's trying to kill you. You know, how should we understand these words? And commentators are really split. Some go hardcore that, hey, they, they are antagonists, they're against him. Others say, no, it's not so. I want to just pause here long enough, not the main point, but long enough to just ask the question, like, are all Pharisees bad guys? Kind of in quotes, okay? Should we look at all Pharisees and just say, look out, look out, they're against, they're not for you. They're not for Jesus, for his ministry, for his mission, okay? Now, if all means all, we need one example. We just need one example of a Pharisee who wasn't a quote-unquote bad guy. We have one. We have more, but I, I want to just give you one example of a Pharisee that had a relationship with Jesus that we get a window in to hear about his story, it's a man named Nicodemus. This is found in John chapter 3. I want to just, not going to spend a lot of time here, but just want to go over and open up that story for a moment. It says, there was a Pharisee. There it is, right? So he's a part of that group. A man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. That's code. Why? I don't want to be associated with you. I'll come at night so people can't tell. And said, Rabbi. We know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So Nicodemus comes at night, tries to pay him a compliment, like, hey, you're doing phenomenal stuff. And Jesus shoots straight past all that and just says, you must be born again. So then Nicodemus, taking it literally, is like, how, how can that happen? How can it just, you're an adult, uh, it's just not possible. There's just, there's some biology and anatomy that just is not going to allow that to work. And, and Jesus, again, bypassing that, says, you must be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying this. To which Nicodemus responds, again, how's, how's this all working? And then Jesus just says, you're Israel's teacher, 
and you don't understand these things? I'm talking to you about base, basic stuff here. You must be born again. That's just baseline, minimum requirements of, of knowing God, is that you experience new life through him. If I'm speaking of these kind of earthly things, normal things, how, how are you going to respond when I really light it up and start talking of heavenly things? And he says, then he says this, no one's ever seen God, okay? Only the one who has come from him. He kind of reveals a little bit of himself to Nicodemus. I've come from the Father's side. And from that point on, we don't get a tremendous amount of detail. But I imagine the spiritual angst that Nicodemus would have had. He comes to Jesus at night, doesn't want to get associated with him, but has questions, has some big time questions, because he's recognizing him doing phenomenal things, but he's trying to understand. And then Jesus kind of just says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must trust in the one who has come from the Father's side. You must trust in me. And just the struggle that Nicodemus would have had as Jesus' profile uh, kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger through time, and, he, and maybe he's there witnessing some of this. Other times he's hearing reports of the things that Jesus is doing and saying. Where does this story end? How does his story end? Is it true? Are, are, are all Pharisees bad guys? We actually get to see the end of the story. This is one of those rare occurrences where we get to see the end of the story. This is after Jesus has died. In John 19, it says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He feared. Joseph of Arimathea feared the Jewish leaders. Peter... Are you associated with that one? I saw you with them. Nope, not me. Must have been some other guy. Looked like me, but wasn't me. Why? If you're associated with him, you risk the same fate as him. Joseph knew this. Nicodemus knew this, and there he was. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Who's there at the end? Who's there at the end? His disciples? No. All abandoned him. Who's there at the end? Nicodemus. Nicodemus is there risking association with him. That could potentially cost him his life. And so are all Pharisees bad guys? I don't think we can make that claim. I think we have to let context determine what's going on in the story. So I think there are some Pharisees, like Nicodemus, that ultimately turned and said, I believe this guy. I'm going to enter through the narrow door. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to follow him. Let's jump back to our story now. When we left it, you know, the Pharisees, some general Generally titled Pharisees had warned him that, that Herod was trying to kill him. Now Jesus makes his reply. Jesus replied, go tell that fox. Uh, Jesus doesn't name call a lot. I wouldn't say that's his pattern. Uh, and in this case, I, I think he's referencing just the cunning, the crafty, the, the wily. The, this is a guy to be careful with. But ultimately... Nothing's going to deter him from what he's called to do. Go tell that fox. And interestingly enough, Luke uses fox, but the feminine. They're, in the language, you can use masculine or feminine, and he stated it in the feminine. Just interesting note. Now, <laughs> go tell that female fox. What? What most scholars think he meant was that Herod had been persuaded previously by Herodias, his wife. And so that's the thinking there is kind of go tell him and her. That's what we think. That's the speculation. Or he's just, I don't, I don't think he's calling him a female fox. I think there's some intentionality maybe there. <laughs> But again, this is real. This threat of Herod is real. He killed John the Baptist. 
But ultimately, Jesus responds, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people. I will keep pressing on. I will keep going. You will not deter me from what I was called to do, which we remember from Luke chapter 4, the scroll of Isaiah, from the prophet Isaiah, I came to do what? Proclaim release for the captives. Proclaim healing to those in need. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You can't persuade me off that. That's what I'm called to do. For some of us in this room, you've been called to something. You know it. I want to be thinking about that as we think about pressing on in life. Okay? Jesus says, undeterred. No threat, even to my life, is going to keep me from doing what I was called to do. I will keep on driving out demons. I will keep on healing people. He says, today and tomorrow and the third day, I will reach my goal. Today and tomorrow is actually kind of a, a common expression that, that, that means now, in the here and now. Obviously, the third day would cause the reader of this gospel to remember the three days, right? Crucified, died, buried, third day he rose again. Obviously, obviously we can draw that connection. He has that in his mind, right? He set his face to Jerusalem. That is ultimately why he came, to, to live among us, to, to show us the way, to demonstrate and teach, but then die on our behalf brings us to this statement, which I want to linger on, okay? In any case, I must, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day. Press on. Press on. Move forward in the midst of hostility. With the threat to my life, I must press on. What, did, what was some of Coolidge's words to the people, to those in uh, who were minorities, those on the fringe, press on. What would have Nicodemus' challenges be as part of the religious ruling class? And he's with all of these other Sadducees and, and priests and lawyers who are speaking ill of Jesus. What would have been the message to him? Press on, press on in your belief, press on in your pursuit. Keep asking questions. Keep thinking about the claims of Jesus. Press on, Nicodemus. And he's not the only one. I want to I wanna consider the example, not just of Jesus, but of one of his followers, the Apostle Paul from Philippians. This is, I want to just, again, linger here just a little bit longer, this idea of pressing on. Pressing on. What do, what do we see from the Apostle Paul on this? This is in a letter that he wrote to a church at a city, in a city called Philippi. In his words here, and I want, I want to burn this on our hearts and on our minds this morning. This idea of pressing on. Because I talk to you. You come up afterwards and, and we talk. Or you come to my office and we talk. And there's a big fleshly switch in us that has written, and just in little small print, there's a little button okay, inside of us. And below that button, just in small print, are the words, screw it. And many of us, on a regular basis, maybe even a daily basis, are tempted to press that button. And screw it may stand for a number of things. You might be thinking about your work, an employer, employee situation, just screw it. You might be thinking about a relationship, a friendship, a romantic relationship. It's not worth it, just screw it. Some of you are struggling because you want to push that button in regard to your faith, in regard to this church or your small group or your mentor or mentee. You just, that button's there, and you're just tempted on a regular basis. I just want to push that button. To which I want to say, press on. Not press the button. <laughs> press on. Okay? Listen to the words from the Apostle Paul here. May this be an encouragement to you this morning. But whatever were, my, were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, trash, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So remember what just preceded this. He gives his spiritual resume all these things that would have been esteemed in the eyes of religious leaders. And he says, I consider them trash. Whatever was to my prophet, I now consider it a complete loss. What do I want? What do I press on toward? Knowing Christ. That's my goal. Not pressing on that I can earn some sort of righteous favor with God. That's not the goal. The goal is to know Christ in all of his fullness, which includes suffering. He continues, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I, there it is, press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here's the beauty of our gospel message. In a moment, you can trust in Christ and one time for all time, be set free from sin, establish a relationship with God. You can go from death to life, from blindness to sight, in a moment, with just one internal yes to the promises of God. The concern is if that message prompts you toward laziness. Taking things for granted. Not building on that first confession or that first prayer. And in doing so, grow cold, calloused. I don't want to go over here and change good theology. It's good theology. From darkness to light, from death to life in a moment. I want to, I want to talk about what it means to press on toward the goal. Because Paul is writing this as a believer in Jesus. He's not saying, as a non-believer, I need to press on, I need to press forward into that part where I become converted and I become a follower of Jesus. No, no, no. He's already a follower and he's giving this instruction and he's giving this encouragement. Press on toward the goal of what? Knowing Christ more. I haven't attained it. This is Paul. He's saying, I haven't attained it. The guy who wrote most of our New Testament is saying, I haven't attained it. And how quickly we can become complacent in our relationship with God. Complacent in our relationships. I feel this. It says, press on, press on. And so how about you? How about you? What area might the Holy Spirit, even now, be prompting you? How he does it with me, he kind of taps me. And he just, he just does a, hey, and he kind of points at something in my life. I'm not trying to over-spiritualize this, nothing dramatic, no, no audible voice, just I feel this, this sense, just kind of a nice tap and then just like a, what about that? And I just wonder if the Holy Spirit might be doing that to you even now. Some area where, where, you're, where you're thinking like, I just want to press that screw it button, I just want to be done, just forget it. And yet for the cause of Christ, because the love of Christ compels us forward, that we might press on. Let's now jump back to our passage here. He just got done saying, I have to, put, I have to press on. I got to keep doing this. And then he says this, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. That is straight in the face of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. I'm going to come back to that in a moment here. Let me let me get to the second half of our passage here. It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Jesus is going to lament over Jerusalem. Why? Because it is supposed to be a cultural beacon, a spiritual cultural beacon for the watching world. Jerusalem has the temple. It has the history. It has patriarchs. It has prophets that have been a part of it. If anyone should know who God is and identify Jesus as Christ and Lord, it should be those in Jerusalem they don't. And that's where I think we need to 
to recognize this next part. It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. Last short history lesson of the morning. Uh, some of you are thankful. Um, l- let me just give you a, a quick history of some of the prophets. Isaiah suffered martyrdom by being sawn in two. Jeremiah uh, suffered martyrdom by stoning. Ezekiel suffered martyrdom in the land of the Chaldeans. Micah suffered martyrdom by Jehoram. Amos tortured by Amaziah and martyred by the son of that same man. I get down to the 11th prophet, Nahum. He died in peace. It's like, awesome, at least one of them. Uh, That's what Jerusalem was known for. Stoning and killing the ones that God sent to help and to speak truth and to correct. Joel Green puts it this way. Stoning is the most common form of execution found in the Old Testament, used in such cases as those involving blasphemy and apostasy. This Old Testament background is important because the indictment against Jerusalem for stoning those who are sent to it thus identifies Jerusalem as attributing blasphemy or apostasy to the very ones whom God has sent. Blasphemy, speaking ill of God. Apostasy, turning from God. God in his zeal for his people out of love sends prophet after prophet after prophet to speak truth, to help out of love that they might know who God is. And prophet after prophet after prophet dies and is killed. They reject the prophet. And they're going to reject Jesus. Jesus, who is truth himself, will be rejected. And yet, what is Jesus' desire? What's Jesus' desire for Jerusalem and the people there, those who might be religious but not God-fearers or God-followers? How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you are not willing. I want us to hear those words this morning. Because some of you are living under a lie that God is not willing to help you. God is unwilling to care for you. God is unwilling. Like, you got to keep with the metaphor, this idea of hen and chicks. And sometimes in the Bible, it's used as this idea of an eagle, okay, taking refuge under the wing for protection, for provision, for care. And God is saying, I want to do that. Jesus is saying, I want to do that for my people. This morning, God is wanting to do that for you. He is willing, he is able. But the criticism is that they were unwilling. So what's the, what's the encouragement? Press into God this morning. Press on in whatever he has for you in the journey. How are you going to do that best? By pressing into him. I think even if, uh, if you look at the image that I, that I brought up this morning when I said press on, what is it? It's a lone hiker going up the mountain. Because when we think about that, we think about tackling the world. Oh, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to take that mountain. Right? I'm going to climb that hill. It's ultimately not what we want. We want you to press on by pressing into God. We want you to press on by pressing into his church. We want to you to press on by pressing into a small group. We want you to press on by pressing into a mentor. We want you to press on as you press into deeper things of God, deeper things into his community. It's ultimately, the, the ladder here, this pressing into, I would say is going to indicate how well you do pressing forward in your life and in your faith. If you're going to press on alone, I don't hold out much hope. Press on, press into. Finally, the last verse here. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
If you're a reader of your Bible, you know that this is used at Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem before he dies. Luke's account has it, kind of has this expression before Jesus gets to Jerusalem. And so you might think like he's referencing that triumphant entry. Matthew actually has the triumphant entry and then Jesus teaching on this, which is likely chronologically where it happens. So this would be an indication kind of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a reference from the Psalms and it's likely referencing the end of all things when Jesus actually returns at the end of all things. So that's likely what's being referenced here. But your house has left you desolate. What does that mean? It could reference the destruction of, of Jerusalem uh, happened in A.D. 70 after this time of Jesus being on earth, uh, but before they would have received this gospel account, it's possible. I, I tend to more favor a, a little bit more general reading of it. This was used throughout the prophets. If you will receive God as your Lord and you will follow him, what will happen? Your house will be full. There's this, this feeling of, of fullness of joy, fullness of people, a gathering, a community. What happens when they reject him? Desolate. The house is empty. No one there. And so this is a passage which warns us, I think. And so I just I have a couple questions that I, I want to ask you to now be applying this to your life. And for some of you, you might need time to extrovert thought with friends. You, you, you know, you're the one in the group that needs to talk about it and then uh, get together and talk about it a little bit more. That's okay. Some of you are introverts and you're already just like stewing something inside. But these passages are there for our welfare, for our benefit, that we might learn from Christ, his teaching and his example. And he has gone before us. I, I mentioned Coolidge in, in his message to press on for, for different groups of people, Right? I mentioned Nicodemus and the challenges that would have come in his life needing to press on. I think of the Apostle Paul and, and his desire to press on to know Christ more. And remember his calling? Part of his calling was I need to show this guy how much he must suffer for my namesake. Like, hey, that's your calling into, into Christian living and, and ministry life. But let's not forget Jesus. Jesus is shown to be the one pressing on at the threat of his life. Now, just went through this in, in an LDI systematic theology class this week, okay? We looked at Jesus, the person of Christ, who is fully God and fully man. And we come to passages like this, and I think it's tempting to just say, okay, yes, that would be hard to be living under threat of your life. And, and yes, it, it would be hard to, to go to the cross, but surely he kind of used kind of divine power to make the human experience less. Like, I, I think we're tempted to think that, which, which is not true. He experienced fullness of humanity. So the mental anguish, the emotional anguish, the spiritual anguish, he felt in its fullness. When we talk about the cross and it being excruciatingly painful, he didn't borrow some of his divine power to make that easier on himself. And so when we talk about pressing on, I want to hold up Christ on the cross, the one who is willing to press on toward that goal and toward that end for our sake. And in doing so, he wants to gather us as a hen does its chicks and say, will you press into me? Will you believe in me? Will you follow me? And so with that in mind, I just want to ask a couple questions. In what ways is God leading you to press on? For some of you, you're feeling close to Christ. You're feeling pressed into him. You're getting enough time with your small group. You're getting enough time to, to feel connected. Like you do your friends, you feel connected to God. Is there any way where you're, you're just growing complacent, not willing to press on, press forward? And this could be at work, could be at school, could be in relationships, could be in your spiritual life. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want this just to be a Sunday thing. I don't, I don't think God and, and Jesus believe like, oh, if you can just get through Sunday, we're, we're good there. It's like, this stuff's meant to be played out in everyday life. Jesus was going through these villages, experiencing everyday life with them, and teaching in the midst of that setting. So just in everyday life, is there something that the Holy Spirit is saying, we need to press on. We've been pressing that screw it button too often recently. We're failing to uphold the confession of faith that we made. We're failing to persevere and endure and press on. 
And then secondly, are there any ways you are unwilling to press into him? The most often given response that I get is, I I tried that and it didn't work. Jesus, if I'm going to press into him, he should just fix it. And he didn't, and therefore I, I, I don't seem as trustworthy. I don't, I'm not going to press into him anymore. He failed me. I don't think so. I know that might be the way you feel. Believe he wants to be there for you in the midst of challenge, everyday challenges. Don't minimize God's care for your life. He cares about every detail. That thing you might think is too small this morning. No, he cares about that. If that's on your thought, if that's on your heart, if that's tripping you up, he wants you to bring that to him and to press into him. Let's pray together.